Today, we're going to be starting a 13-part series called Steps to Christ. Now, this series is perfect whether you're a beginner or whether you're seasoned in the Christian walk. Maybe someone out there today is thinking to themselves, I would like to walk with the Lord, but I just don't know where to begin. What's the first step to take on Steps to Christ? These lessons will be perfect for you. And if you're an experienced Christian who's kind of been on the journey for quite some time, that's okay too, because 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2 says, If any man thinketh he knoweth anything, he knoweth it not as he ought to know it. And so we can never exhaust the Bible. We can never say that on any subject in the Bible that we have fully come to a complete understanding and have nothing less to learn. But often... Going back to the fundamentals, kind of going over the foundation over and over again, helps you to have a consistent, strong Christian life. So we'd like to invite you to join us on this journey as we begin this series. And my prayer is that each and every one of us will have a deeper experience with God through these lessons. Let us begin our first one with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege that we have to study your Bible, for it truly is a privilege. And as we discuss these 13 lessons on how to either begin or to deepen our walk with you, we want to invite your Holy Spirit to be present. I pray that he would be the one to speak to each one of us, uh, that he would touch each of our hearts individually and personally where we are at, and give us all the experience that we are seeking for. We ask that you would answer this prayer not because we earn it nor deserve it, but because your son Jesus shed his blood that it might be so. So in his precious name we pray. Amen. Our first lesson is entitled, God's Love for Man. For the very foundation, the very first step on getting to know God is to get to know who he is and what the Bible says about him. And we're, what you're going to see in this first lesson is that God is in fact love. We're going to look at this in four points today. Number one, we're going to see from the Bible that God is love. Number two, we're going to look at the definition of love. Number three, we're going to see that trials are permitted out of love. Number four, that his character of love has clearly been revealed to us. And then we'll review at the end to make sure that we didn't miss anything along the way. So let's begin with our first point at this time. God is love. The Bible says, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this is an important principle to start with. You see, in my personal experience, I was an atheist for the majority of my life. The better part of the first 21 years of my life was spent as, as it were, an atheist. And when I would think about the Christian God, the God that Christians believed in as I understood it back then, was a, a vindictive God, a judgmental God, a God who actually enjoyed torturing those who did not practice their lives according to that which he said. And this was kind of the view that I personally had of God. So when Christians would tell me that God is love, I wasn't so sure if that was really true. But as I began my journey as a Christian, once I believed in the Bible and I began to study the Bible, I found this verse that says God is love. You see, God is in fact love. But there is a challenge with that thought. And the challenge is, what is love? You see, in our world today, in the English language, I believe love is one of the most abused words, overused words that we have. For instance, you might be able to relate with this. Often I have said as a young teenager, when someone would ask me, do you like pizza? I would respond with, I love pizza. Or someone would say, do you like your car? And I would tell them, I love my car. Bought my first car when I was 14 years old, and that car was literally the love of my life. I would tell people, I love my car. I rebuilt it myself. It was a precious car to me. Someone would ask me, how do you feel about your parents? I would tell them, 
well, I love my parents. And someone would ask me, well, how do you feel about your dog? Now, I didn't say I love my dog, but someone out there might say that they love their dog. And so what you see is the word love in all of those different examples has a different meaning. So when God says, excuse me, so when the Bible says God is love, is that the same love that I have for pizza? Is that the same love I have for an animal? Is that the love I have for a parent? What does that love look like? And the sad reality is many of us in our experience with love has kind of been a hurtful experience. Maybe someone told you in your life, I love you and then abandoned you. Maybe someone said, I love you, and then they broke your heart. Maybe someone said, I loved you, and then they betrayed you. And the picture that you have of love is one of someone who gets close only to hurt you. We all have different views of love and different interpretations of this word. So when the Bible says God is love, there's a challenge there, and that's how do you view love? And so point number two, we're going to talk about the definition of love. And when I say the definition of love, we're not using Webster's Dictionary to define this word. We're going to let the Bible interpret itself. We're going to let the Bible explain what is love. What is this love that it is talking about? And then we can know that that's what God is saying of himself. For the Bible says, God is love. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 and verse 5, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and seeks no evil. Here we have a definition of love, and many call this the chapter of love, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And here in the center of this passage on the screen, I want you to notice, I believe, the core of what love is according to the Bible. The Bible says that love does not seek its own. In a world so full of selfishness, in a world where almost every decision that we make as people is how will this benefit me? How will this new job benefit me? How will this new relationship benefit me? When we think this way so often, the Bible challenges us to think like this, do not seek your own. This is biblical love. You see, love is not selfishness. In fact, love is the opposite. It is selflessness. So if love does not seek its own, then what does love seek? It seeks the benefit of others. This is what love is. Love is caring more for someone else than you care for yourself. So as the Bible defines love in this way, remember, God is love. That would mean God cares more for you. God cares more for others. God would put others first before he considers himself. This is why I believe the Bible says in Psalm 145, verse 15 and 16, the eyes of all look expectantly to you. And you, speaking of God, give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Notice in the passage, here, God doesn't just give them their food in due season. He doesn't just supply the bare minimum necessity to survive, but it actually says that he opens his hand and desire, uh, satisfies the desires of every living thing. God actually wants you to be happy. God wants to satisfy the desires that you have. Notice what Jonah says, describing God, in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Now, to understand the context of what Jonah is saying here, Jonah was asked by God to go to the city of Nineveh and to proclaim to the city of Nineveh that it was going to be destroyed. Now, Jonah decided to not do that and to flee the opposite direction on a boat, 
across the sea to a place called Tarshish. Now, in God's providence, through a miraculous way, God brought Jonah back to the city of Nineveh, though he didn't want to go originally. And when Jonah finally arrived at Nineveh, he decided to proclaim the message of the Lord, that the city was going to be destroyed. However, the people of Nineveh and the king himself all repented and turned from their evil ways. And the Lord spared the city and ended up not destroying it. That's why Jonah is saying in this passage, uh, when uh, he's describing his experience, he said, this is why I fled in the first place. This is why I wasn't even wanting to go to Nineveh, because I know what kind of God you are. You're a merciful God. You're a gracious God. You're, you're slow to anger, and you're abundant in loving kindness. And in essence, what he's saying is, I figured you would forgive them. I figured you would show them mercy. That's why I didn't want to come here and proclaim this message. Because you see, that is the type of God that we have in the Bible. A merciful God. A patient God. As the Bible says, God is love. In Micah, it says it this way. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. You see, this was a new picture of God that I had never known or understood. I didn't view God as a merciful, patient God. I viewed him as one who had a checklist, who was longing with desire to strike me dead as soon as I fell short of his expectations of me. But no, this is not the picture that the Bible paints of God. It's a God who is merciful and understanding, who is patient, who wants each of us to be saved and to make it on this experience in life. This is the type of God that the Bible teaches about and one who cares more for you than himself. But if this is true about God, then why are there trials? Why are there struggles that we face in life? This brings us to point number three, that I believe trials are permitted out of love. When did trials first begin? If we go back to the story in the book of Genesis to Adam and Eve, we get this picture. After Adam and Eve have sinned, and fallen, and were found naked, and God approached them and began to have a discussion with them, notice what God tells them. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Now, when you think back to Genesis chapter 1, if you remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, uh, it describes how the, the fruit of the tree was going to be the food or the meat for Adam and his wife Eve, uh, that this is what they were to live off of. And particularly, they had fruit from the tree of life itself. However, after sin, something changed. They were now to live off not only the fruit of the trees, but also of the vegetation of the ground. And here the Bible says that the ground is going to be cursed and they would have to toil for it to get the ground to produce that which they were going to need. But there's a phrase in here that is important that you can't miss. He says, cursed is the ground for your sake. In other words, it's for your benefits. It was for your benefit that the ground was going to be cursed. It was for your benefit that you're going to now work in order to obtain your food, that there was something about this minor hardship that you're going to experience that was actually going to be for your benefits. Let's look at another passage to kind of get a better understanding of this. In James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking to yourself, hmm, When I go through trials, I don't start jumping up and down screaming for joy. But here the Bible says, you should count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I don't believe that means that we should create our own trials and make our lives harder to find joy. However, there's a purpose in trials. There's a purpose in working through things. Verse 3, the Bible goes on to say, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see, why should you count it joy when you fall into various trials? It doesn't mean that the trial isn't hard. 
it doesn't even mean that the trial is fun. In fact, I've been through many trials in my life, in my personal experience, and I don't count any of them as fun. However, when I'm in the midst of a trial and I'm going through a tough time, I can still count it joy because I know what the product of that trial will be, that the trial will form my character. It will make me a stronger Christian. It'll give me a chance to exercise my faith in God. And the trial isn't meant to break me, but the trial is actually meant to make me stronger. And now you may be thinking to yourself, but what if I can't bear the trial? What if the trials in my life are too much? You see, the beautiful thing is that will never happen. For the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Here we have a beautiful promise from God that he will never allow a temptation. He will never allow a circumstance to come into your life that will be so difficult, that will be so challenging that you will be incapable of bearing through the trial. Now, I know at times it may feel that way, that it may feel that the trial is unbearable, but I'd like to give you an illustration that an individual gave me when I was a brand new Christian. Uh, he was a physician, and I remember he was explaining this to me, and I thought it was kind of funny. I thought to myself, well, I, I'm pretty sure I know what I can handle, and I don't think I can handle the trial I'm going through. And he said, well, think about it this way. And he, we were in his kitchen. He had, he had a knife, and he, he asked the question, could you handle someone cutting you with a knife? Well, my immediate response was, no, <laughs> if you stabbed me with a knife, I couldn't handle that. That would be too much pain for me to endure. He then said something remarkable. He said, well, what if you're going through surgery and they had to cut you up and put you back together? Could your body endure a knife? And I thought about that and the answer was yes. And he said, see, you can endure more than you think you can. When it comes to trials in life, often some of them can feel like they are unbearable. But God promises it will never be beyond what you can handle. And then it says, with it, he will make a way of escape. There will be a, a doorway to walk through to help you to get through this experience that you're going through. This is a promise that God has given us. Now, here's the beautiful thing about God. In the Bible, he never asks us to do anything that he himself is not willing to go through nor experience. It says here in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, speaking of Jesus, God who became flesh, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience, notice, by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You see, Jesus here is being described as a son who had to learn obedience. You see, he had to learn how to be obedient to the Father. He had to actually grow. And according to Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it teaches us that he actually grew, not just physically, but in wisdom and in stature and with favor with God and with man, that Jesus himself had to grow and develop and he grew and developed by the things which he suffered. And as we seek to be like him, as we seek to follow in his footsteps, yes, there will be trials as a result of sin. Not that God ever intended it to be that way, but as a result of sin, there will be trials, there will be tribulations, there will be temptations, but God has promised that he will not only see us through it, but that as we get through it, we'll be stronger than when we first entered it. And God experiences your trials with you. Isaiah 63 verse 9 says, In all their affliction, speaking of God, he was afflicted. You see, when you are hurt, God himself experiences pain. When we suffer, the heart of God is broken. In all of our affliction, he himself is afflicted. And so when you go through these experiences, you can know that you're not alone. In fact, God gives a promise in the book of Hebrews. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He will always be by your side, regardless of what you're going through. And not only will he enter into the experience with you,
but he will always produce something good out of the experience. It says here in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good. Now, it doesn't say all things are good, but it says all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, God can take a real messed up situation and bring a powerful message out of it. God can take a test that you're facing in life right now and bring a remarkable testimony out of it. This is the power of God. He can take any situation, and it says here, all things can work together to good if we will choose to love God and if we will choose to follow Him. This reminds me of a story I once heard about a woman who was going through a garden. And as the woman was going through a garden, she was getting caught on the thorns, and she began to weep and to cry over the thorns of the garden. She said, who ruined this garden? Look at the garden, spoiled with thorns. They only cause hurt and pain. And another individual was walking through the same garden. This individual had a guide with her. And she said, why does the woman cry over the thorns? And he pointed out that she was missing the roses. He said, of course there are thorns. Of course there are thistles. But notice the roses, the lilies, and the pinks. See, if you were to grab a rose today, every rose has thorns. And though we can choose to look at the thorns, though we can choose to focus on the thorns, there's a beautiful rose at the top that calls for our attention. Life is like that. Often there are trials to bear. There are challenges to face. But even on the top of a stem of thorns, God brings a beautiful rose. If we will learn to trust Him with our lives and with the situations that we're facing, God will do remarkable things with it. And this brings me to my fourth point, that God's character of love has been clearly revealed to us. Because you may be thinking, well, how can I trust him with my life? How can I trust him with these situations? How can I trust him with the challenges that I'm facing? Remember, our first point, God is love. And see, in order to trust God with our life in these situations, we have to understand and believe that he really is who he claims to be that he is love. That's why it is the first step. That is why it is the beginning of a journey on a walk with God to know that first he is, in fact, love. So how is his character of love clearly revealed? What evidence has he given to us that we can know that this truly is who he is? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, Jesus says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Here Jesus is saying, no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one will understand and know the Father unless it is the will of the Son to reveal the Father to that individual. So the only way we can truly know the Father is through the Son. So one day, one of Jesus' disciples asked him a question. Show us the Father. And that makes sense, right? Because he said, I'm the only one who can show the Father. This is in John chapter 14. Notice Jesus' response. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? You see, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, the passage that we just read before, that no one can know the Father unless it is the will of the Son to reveal the Father to him. But here's the beautiful thing. I believe it is the will of Jesus to reveal the Father to each and every one of us. And he says it right here plainly. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So through looking at Jesus, that is how we can see the Father. In this way, it is how Jesus reveals the Father to us. We can look at the life of Jesus and get a glimpse into a picture, a clear picture of who God really is. What is his character all about? There's a text that summarizes the work of Jesus, and I like to read it. It's in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Bible says, 
Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Here we see the work of Jesus. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, that sounds like a remarkable work. That sounds like a fulfilling work. But remember where Jesus came from. For that was a remarkable and fulfilling work. But it came with much sacrifice. You see, Jesus once sat upon the throne, clothed with garments of a king. He had the adoration of heaven. He walked upon streets of gold. He had perfect, open communion face to face with his father. But one day, he chose to leave all that behind. One day, he chose to take off the crown, to take off the robe, to leave the streets of gold, to leave the comforts of the life that in the existence that he had always known. Why? To preach to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. To bring deliverance. To open eyes. And to set us at liberty. He cared more for you than he cared for himself. He left so much behind just to make our lives better. God truly, according to the Bible, is love. But you see, he didn't just come to make our lives better. He didn't just come to help us with the day-to-day affairs of life. But he did something even beyond that. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, the Bible says, speaking of Jesus, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. See, the Bible paints a picture that Jesus went through an experience. God sent his son, who be- God became flesh, And he died for us. He died for the sins that we committed. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Literally, my sins nailed the Son of God to the cross. It was because of my sins that Jesus died. It was because of our sins God died. And it's remarkable to me that he was willing to do so much. That he was not only willing to come and leave the comforts of life, to make our life better. But he was willing to come and to die the death that we deserve, that we might have a chance to live the life that he deserved, probably knowing that most people would reject it anyways. Yet he still came and paid that price. You see, in this was manifested the love of God, as 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 says. In what was manifested the love of God? that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. This is where the love of God is most clearly seen. To a world that did not love Him, that He loved. He poured all of heaven in this one gift, the gift of His only begotten Son. Only begotten, that means there's no other. That means there's no backup plan. That means there's no secondary. There's one and only one. And God gave him for you and for me. Now often when we think of Jesus, we think of his death. We think of the pain and the agony that he went through. And when we look at the pain and the agony that he went through, we think, wow, Jesus really loved us. And he did. He really loves you. To this day, he still loves you. He paid the price way back then, 2,000 years ago, with you in mind. But I like to focus on someone else. Was it easy for the Father? Was it easy for the Father to give His only Son? Think about it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter tried to defend Jesus and he had to stop him and said, Do you not know that I can pray and my Father will send 12 legions of angels? See, there was an army in heaven. But what occurred next? Jesus was betrayed by a friend with a kiss. He was dragged to the high priest, to Herod, 
eventually to Pontius Pilate himself. On this journey, he was ridiculed. He was mocked. Was it easy for the father to watch his son betrayed and abandoned by those who were supposed to be by his side? Was it easy for the father to watch them blind his son, to cover his son's eyes, and to punch him in the face, and to say, prophesy, which one of us punched you? Was it easy for the father to see the soldiers put a crown of thorns upon the head of his son? Was it easy for the father to see them rip the flesh from the back of Jesus with those whips? I do not think it was easy for the Father. I think of when they bowed down to Jesus and wrapped him in a purple robe and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. I can imagine with my mind in heaven, heavenly angels longing and desiring to pick up arms and to defend their commander, to defend the one in whom they love so much. And yet the Father saying, Stop. It must be because I love them. You see, if I were a father and someone were hurting my son, I can imagine of nothing more painful than that. I can imagine nothing that would cause me to jump in and to defend my son more than someone who would hurt my child. But here God the Father held himself back that Jesus might go through this. Why? Because he loved you. Jesus, after this, would then carry the cross toward Calvary. He would become so tired He would be so thirsty. He would definitely be hungry, not eaten or drinking anything since he was taken as a prisoner. And he was so exhausted that he literally collapsed under the weight of the cross and could not even bear it for himself. Once he would reach his destination, he'd be nailed to that cross and hung up for all to see, naked and exposed. And as the sun would be shrouded in darkness, The Bible says that Jesus said something that I believe was the pinnacle of the pain for the Father. That I believe was at a point that caused the most hurt to the Father. And that was these words. Matthew chapter 27 verse 46. And at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If I can put that in common language. Dad, Dad, where are you? You see, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2 tells us that sin separates us from God. And this, as Jesus put on himself the sins of the world, it would cause a separation between him and his father in such a way that he could not sense his father. Now we know the beautiful truth that Behind the darkness of this this wall of sin that was separating him, the father was there with a broken heart. Imagine being a parent, hearing those words, Dad, Dad, where are you? Or Mom, Mom, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? I know that these words had to ring the very heart of God. And though he could have intervened, though he could have stopped the whole thing in a moment, he chose not to. The Father chose to endure. The Son, Jesus himself, did not have to stay. At his own word, he could have went back to heaven. But he chose not to. Why did they refrain? Though the Godhead was experiencing so much pain, it's simple. Because they loved you that much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So when the Bible says, God is love. And when the Bible teaches that love is putting others before yourself, you can look at the experience of Jesus and the Father and know that that really is who he claims to be. He loves you so much that he gave his son for you. Our last point is a quick review to make sure we didn't miss anything along the way. We saw first that the Bible teaches that God is love. And we define that from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is love does not seek its own. So true Bible love is putting someone else before oneself. It is selflessness, which is the opposite of selfishness. 
This is true love. And yes, there are trials in life, but this doesn't make, mean that God isn't love. And in fact, often trials are given out of love as a way to allow us to grow and to develop. And God measures every trial. He'll never let it be more than what you can handle. He'll be with you every step of the way. And when you hurt, he suffers by your side. And through it all, he will bring roses upon the stem of thorns. This is what God will do for you and for me. And his character of love was most clearly revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you choose to embrace the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for yourself, if you choose today to say, I, want, I choose to believe in that, I choose by faith, which is belief, to accept that Jesus died for me individually and personally that I might live, you can choose to do that today. In your own heart, in your own mind, with your own words at home, you can say, Lord, I believe, and I want you to be my personal Lord and Savior. And you can begin your own journey today, your own steps to Christ. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed to us, that we should be called the children of God. This is an amazing thought. You actually can be called a child of God. If you believe in Jesus by faith, if you begin that journey hand in hand with Him, you as of right now are a son or a daughter of the King of the universe. You are adopted into His family through faith. I hope that today, if this is an experience you have never had, that you would choose to make the decision while it is still today. Don't put off till tomorrow a decision that God may be speaking to your heart to make today. And for those of us who have been walking with the Lord for some years now, it's a good time to recommit that walk. It's like uh, re renewing your vows with your spouse. It's never, it never hurts to renew your vows with God, to recommit to the Lord to accept him fresh into your life, which we ought to do every single day, and to continue the journey on the steps towards Christ. So now that we see God's love, I have a question. What is keeping us from experiencing the transforming power of God's love? We see that God is love, and we see what that love means, definition-wise, but how does that love now impact me in a transformative way. How does it transform me? How does it renew me? How does it impact my life on a day-by-day -day basis? That we'll be talking about in Lesson 2, The Sinner's Need of Christ. So for today, I hope that you can take with you, God is love. He loves you personally. He cares more for you than you can possibly know. And if you choose to accept Him by faith into your heart today, you can begin your own journey on your steps toward Christ. Father in heaven, thank you for the chance to study your word. I pray that you would bless each and every one of us on our own walk with you, that you would help those who, of us who are making the decision for the first time today to be able to believe and to follow through with this journey, that it won't end with just this decision but that they'll come back time after time to study your word, to continue this journey, which is a journey truly for all eternity. And for those of us who are simply renewing our hearts with you today, help us to fall in love with you afresh, Lord. Help us to see you for the great God that you are and to always keep that first love that once burned so brightly in our hearts. Please bless us to this end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.